Welcome to Movie Night at the John Miller Vernon Cinema. Night. And welcome to Back to Campus, welcome to a new semester, and uh, especially welcome to new students and faculty. Happy Halloween, so many reasons to celebrate. And of course that we are here, and that we're still alive. <laughs> um, you looked amazing, I wish you had kept, I'm so glad <laughs> that the Wizard Pop Master himself is wearing in costume, but all of you should. Um, and I'm glad that you are sort of embracing Halloween. I kind of thought maybe, um, you know, with my decorating the library and uh, writing these blog posts that you felt it was kind of silly. So, uh, so I was so happy to see that you are actually embracing this wonderful holiday. I didn't grow up with it, right? So this is an American holiday, uh, which I was not familiar when I came here. And I just think it's a really cool holiday. Um, I mean, every country in Europe has something similar. Um, in my country, uh, girls, not really boys, although very small boys maybe, but girls dress up as witches. Not goblins or wizards or anything else, just witches. And your mom and your grandmother, they sew your costume, and you're equipped with a broom and a tea kettle, and you walk to people's houses like that, you know, walk the rest. You're not doing trick or treat. You are begging, basically. Um, you're you're giving them, you're offering them your tea kettle, and for money, for candy, for apple, anything. And then some very weird thing <laughs> takes sort of a sinister turn. So at the end of the day, you're supposed to say goodbye to your family and fly on the broom to the Blue Mountain to consort or convert or with the devil. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from, but anyway. So, so that's the closest thing. And there's no pumpkin, there are no parades, no parties. People don't decorate the houses. So, so this is pretty cool. Um, OK, so normally, we don't allow food and drink in the barbers, you know. <laughs> uh, we decided to make an exception uh, this evening. Um, because of everything we've gone through this past year um, and also the many reasons to celebrate and of course it's movie night and I guess that requires that. <laughs> so please dig in. I have to ask you those to, you know, be a little bit careful with sodas and stuff, right? And, and not, you know, take our books without washing your hands and stuff. But anyway, we want you to enjoy the snacks, okay? All right, so... Today's movie was first aired on the Smithsonian Cable Channel in late August and features the discovery of a tomb, a coffin, and a skeleton. So very appropriate for Halloween. Um, probably you're familiar with the plot. If not, it's all about mystery. Right? It's the fall of one enigmatic civilization, the rise of another, um, a mysterious seal, no magnifying glass, magical beads, gold rings with uh, cryptic, esoteric symbolism, and lots of other mechanisms. So, typically a Halloween mystery. Okay. Before we get started, I have asked the wizard, Puppet Master himself, to say a few words. As you know, the discovery was made by two world-renowned archaeologists whom we all know and love, and, and one of them is here tonight. Um, I have asked him to speak about the making of this movie, so the behind-the-scenes stuff. But of course, since he arrived in the U.S. just yesterday, we would also love to hear a fresh update from Pilos from Greece. Okay. So, I understand that you are jet lagged, <laughs> and um, you know, I really appreciate that you stayed awake, and you look very, very cute <laughs> as the canine. <laughs> and so here is Professor Davis.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, for the invitation. As you were saying, I got back at uh, just in time for the fourth quarter of the Packers game last night from, uh, from Athens after one of those monumental 20-hour travel days. So I'm pretty blasted from the, uh, from, from the trip. But it's good to see you all. Thanks for coming out on a Friday afternoon. That's, uh, that's a terrific testimony to your interest in what goes on in this department. And I know not many of you have had the chance to see this film before. Uh, it's an interesting film. Um, the, uh, they usually, on the television channels, tell you to stay tuned after the film for the backstory, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it in reverse this time because I may be asleep by the end of the by, by the end of the film. Uh, the uh, uh, there have been, as Rebecca said, uh, in 2015. Uh, Sharon Stocker from this department and I uh, had started a new campaign of excavations at the site of Pelos, where we had been working in various ways since uh, the early 1990s. But uh, although Sharon had done some excavation, that's another story, we hadn't had really systematic excavation since Carl Blagan's death in 1971 as a department. And quite miraculously, just as Carl Blagan on his first day of excavation discovered the, both the throne room and the archives room of this wonderful Mycenaean palace that he called the Palace of Nestor, so on our very first day of excavation, we discovered, totally by accident, as a plan B because we weren't able to dig where we wanted to dig, we discovered this, this grave. Uh, rather unassuming looking grave, but it turned out to have some thousands of individual artifacts, precious materials that had accompanied the burial of a single individual uh, to the hereafter. And since 2015, we've been occupied in one way or another of studying the various objects, several thousand objects from this grave, and trying to make sense of them all individually and their patterning, patterning in within the grave as grave goods. Uh, we've been featured on several television shows since. I think the first was on the Discovery Channel. We were part of a show about Mycenaeans. And uh, there was another show on British TV uh, that was made in the, the following year, in which we were again a part of a larger story. But right at the beginning of COVID, we were approached by a British production company producing a film for the series Secrets on the Smithsonian Channel here in the States and uh, for another, for a BBC series. And they asked us, they told us that they would want to do a special show just about us. So that temptation was too much for us to say no, no matter how annoying production companies can be. And they are very, very annoying. Tell you. And Carol Hershenson, who's here tonight, understands just how annoying they are because a lot of the annoyance falls her way when they want this and they want that, and this permission and that permission, then they change their minds and they want something else. It's a long, drawn out process. In, in the event, uh, we had COVID breakout, and the producers for the show were not able to come to Greece. So the story is they sent a production company, a Greek, a Greek production company, a local producer to shoot lots of film and send it to London where the main production company is based. And we had no idea what this film would look like in the end. We were concerned. Uh, we were concerned because of what uh, previous productions that we had assisted with uh, had looked like in the end. I think our first experience was with a production company in Rhode Island that told us they were going to make us make us both stars. And I think we had about 30 seconds in the finished show. <laughs> Definitely not star material. Um, but we were hopeful and we were very collaborative this time, very cooperative, although it took masses of our time. Uh, the, uh, and then we didn't hear from them for about a year to the extent that we thought that they had given up on the idea of producing the show. 
and we, so we were, we were unhappy. They weren't responding to our emails. Then suddenly they started responding again and they wanted more stuff and they told us they were almost done and they would certainly send us a copy of the film and they would tell us what it was going to show on TV and they didn't. And finally, my sister saw it advertised on cable TV and alerted me to the fact. And uh, there it was on the Smithsonian Channel, a channel that we don't subscribe to. And we didn't have a copy, so I subscribed to it very briefly just so we could see the show and then canceled my subscription. <laughs> and uh, the final product, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's not as bad as we thought it could be. <laughs> and, 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 and thinking about it, since I've seen it about three times, I don't think there's any part of it that I've actually, I seriously disagree with in the end. But they were unhappy clearly having us as talking heads for this show. So they brought in a very well-known British uh, uh, historian uh, named Bethany Hughes, she's wildly popular on the BBC. And they had her do all the voiceover stuff. And how does this work exactly? Uh, she takes questions that were asked of us and our responses, and she pretends they're her own. <laughs> Which, you know, it, so what you hear from Bethany Hughes is pretty intelligent. <laughs> or at least as intelligent as Sherry and I are capable of being. Uh, and I guess finally, before we you see this, it, it's not all that long because there are spaces left for commercials. Uh, Sherry regrets not being here today. She had some surgery last week, and she's still not 100%. And she's going back to Pylos on, on Sunday. And the reason I was in Pylos was because she was here having the surgery. And we're now swapping places in reverse. And she's taking over again the excavations. Because, uh, make this really brief, because after we thought we were done with the site, more or less, in 2018, we thought we'd do a little more subsidiary excavation. We learned more about the Bronze Age town around the palace of Blagan, that Blagan dug. And it, lightning struck again. On the very first day of the excavation, we discovered two brand new Mycenaean, er, uh, early Mycenaean, which is 15th century BC, uh, Tholos tombs, or beehive tombs. And they're big. One is 12 meters across, the other is 8.5 meters across. The one that's 12.5 meters across is four and a half to five meters deep, and we're still digging them. And we've been digging them year round since 2018 with crews in the field, which is a very labor intensive and a very expensive business. But if we weren't doing it year round, we'd be there after, after our deaths to keep with the Halloween thing. <coughs> so uh, without any more delay, here it is, the tomb of the Griffith warrior. All you want to know about it up until this point and our thoughts on the subject. So, Maestro. As the civilization that invented the modern world burst into life and condemned another to fire and flame.